Um, but I just would want to welcome you to the third installment of uh, our, I guess we're calling it our spring lecture series. And um, with us is uh, Dr. Nicholas Bellantoni, the uh, I believe state archeologist emeritus. Uh, I'm sure that everybody in this, um, this 30 plus people that we have in attendance know exactly who Dr. Nicholas Bellantoni is. Um, he doesn't need very much introduction, um, but he's gonna be talking about his book, And So the Tomb Remains, a forthcoming book uh, that we're really excited to um, be able to present this and have him speak about this book uh, before it comes out and, and talk about this subject. So uh, we'll give it over to you, uh, Dr. Balantoni, and thank you so much for being with us. Okay, well, thank you. And thank the, the, the FOSA and the ASC for, for hosting me again. We're always thrilled to come on. And we, we can, listen, we can't wait until we can all get together um, in person. Uh, I miss seeing uh, you guys. All right, thanks, Bob. Uh, actually, the book is already out. It, it came out uh, this winter, late this winter. So it is available to anybody that is crazy enough to want to read about these adventures, but we're, it is available. And I'll give you some information about that later. Um, many of you know, I retired about seven years ago. One of the things I wanted to do at that point was in order to keep me off the streets and get me out of bed is to start writing some of my um, experiences. And um, the first book was The Long Journey Homes on the Repatriations, a uh, couple of repatriations we were involved with. And then I thought for the second book, I, I wanted to do something about our tomb experiences because um, probably my infamous claim to fame is I've probably been in more historic tombs than probably anybody, certainly in New England or, or in the whole uh, United States. So what I did is I put together uh, five case studies of, of various tomb projects we've had over the years. And I'm excited to give this tonight because of the fact that, um, you know, many FOSA members and a, uh, ASC members actually helped me on, on these projects. And uh, um, we are indebted to all of them that, that, uh, that helped us out uh, on these many uh, tomb adventures. Um, we called it the, the, And So the Tomb Remained. It's basically taken from a poem by Thomas Hardy, who laments over his wife's family's tomb, who's in disarray. And, um, you know, he, he, he laments in the poem about, you know, nobody remembers uh, who's buried here anymore. And the tomb is crumbling, but yet it is the only thing of the past that remains. And I thought it was kind of apropos for this book because um, many of the projects we were involved with, as you'll see, had to do with restoration of, of historic uh, family tombs that were really in the process of tumbling. Uh, and uh, one, in one case, it had been completely lost. So to resurrect them, and so the tomb uh, remained. The, the five tomb investigations I deal with are um, um, the Pickin family tomb in Center Cemetery in East Hartford, the, the Gershom Buckley tomb in Colchester, Connecticut. Uh, Samuel Huntington, one of our founding fathers um, in Norwich burying ground. Uh, and um, I was involved, in, those were you know, two restoration projects. And I was also involved with two uh, uh, police investigations, criminal investigations for vandalisms uh, in two particular cemeteries that I highlight, uh, the Chauncey Mausoleum at Indian Hill Cemetery in Middletown and the Edwin Dennison Morgan tomb in Cedar Hill Cemetery uh, in Hartford. So um, some of these were tomb restorations where I was asked to go in and help identify um, you know, family members who were in these tombs where there were no records of burial records or, or anything. Nobody knew who were in these tombs um, until we got involved. And, uh, and then two were um, you know, police investigations uh, where vandals had gone in and stole skeletal remains. Uh, and I'll highlight some of that. I just want to, uh, you know, state uh, how and why we were involved with this. And as many of you know, the state archaeologist uh, has uh, um, statutory responsibilities for to investigate skeletal remains that are uncovered that are 50 years old or more. Um, so we have assisted in exhumations and removals. Uh, in these cases, we were asked in some cases uh, by the family uh, to come in and and do the work. So. We try to make sure that there's a proper handling of the remains during the restoration, uh, reconstruction of the tombs. 
We assist law enforcement um, into vandalisms and, uh, and return all the remains appropriately back inside their family tombs so that um, and, and, and everything is um, restored uh, and put to rest. And when we can, uh, when it is possible, we try to uh, involve descendants um, uh, in the projects. Now, these family tombs were really of the, the elite, the higher uh, socioeconomic status during the colonial and historic period. So these people uh, have, uh, you know, the various families have a, a lot of genealogical research that was very helpful in, in uh, having descendants uh, involved. So uh, let, me, let me just take you back uh, uh, even further than New England itself uh, with, uh, with the issue of graves and marking graves. You know, if you went back to medieval times in Europe, uh, the only people that really got marked graves were um, uh, the noble, the aristocracy, uh, important people who were usually buried in churches or underneath churches, uh, many times in stone uh, coffins. Uh, um, but common people, uh, the average person, uh, did not have a, a marked burial. And when people were, you know, uh, dying, if you will, or preparing for death, they would often ask their families uh, that they wanted to be buried at Santo or near the saint. And the idea is uh, certainly um, the relics of saints were, were kept in, in, in Catholic churches and um, to be buried near the saint, maybe the saint would, you know, use his influence to help you get through the pearly gates, you know? So people wanted to be buried near churches. So churchyards in Europe, especially uh, through time, literally became boneyards because of so many burials and the fact that these burials were not marked uh, adequately. Uh, you know, I, I used the, the, the portrait, the, the photo here, of, of you remember Shakespeare and Hamlet where Hamlet's digging Ophelia's grave and he um, comes up with a skull and in the skull he recognizes that of York. York was the court jester who had died months earlier. And he said, poor York, uh, I knew him well. Uh, and, and this would have resonated with Shakespeare's audience because this was very common. They'd go put a, a, a modern grave in and they would hit the bones of others. Um, and so there was a, a great deal of dispersal. Um, and some questioned the sanctity of the grave. Would the body be prepared for the day of resurrection if its remains had been scattered because of the excavation of new graves on top of it? So about the time of Shakespeare, people started in Europe uh, to mark the graves by putting a simple stone over the recently buried loved ones. Now, uh, it wasn't engraved, but it was just a simple stone as if to say, look, somebody's already here, dig elsewhere. Uh, and so eventually when the Puritans first came here and settled in the 1630s, they really didn't have a great tradition of tombstones. Um, and because they were against uh, uh, Catholicism and, and, and papal authority, um, they did not want church burials. They wanted burials on commons or farmers burying in the backyard. That would change later. Uh, and in some cases, some of the churches or meeting houses were where um, graveyards had earlier had been. Um, so the family, so we start seeing the marking of graves, those iconic you know, colonial tombstones around the end of the 17th and certainly into the uh, uh, 18th century. Family tombs begin, we see mostly around the time of the American Revolution. And basically um, these were families that could afford to erect an edifice, uh, usually dug into the side of a hill um, to house their family. And, and I, I believe the, the issue was that being in a tomb, not only were you together um, so that on the day of resurrection, the whole family could rise up together, but also it kept the burden of the soil, the heavy soil from crushing your coffin and invading. Uh, and then eventually, you know, ashes to ashes, um, disintegrating uh, the remains that were there. So we only see this in, in, in families that are, are prosperous. Um, uh, and could afford to uh, to build these tombs for their uh, themselves and their descendants. But you know, th those of you in in, uh, in the archaeological society and among in the friends group, you know, you know cemeteries. Uh, you've done enough work to understand that 
cemeteries really reveal our cultural history, our changes through time uh, on how we, our, our beliefs, our mores, our values, not only with death, uh, but with social status. Um, and so we love cemeteries because, uh, and need to preserve cemeteries because they, they tell so much about our behavior. So um, we're going to go through these really quick. Uh, you know, the, the each one. Uh, I was going to say each one is a book, but I guess I compiled them all in one book, didn't I? Um, but uh, we'll, we'll give you an idea of, of of the history, a little bit of the background of the families, a little bit of um, uh, the archaeological techniques we used in these tombs, and what we were confronted with when we went in, and certainly some of the forensic work that was done to identify. Uh, um, various people that was really quite, along with genealogical research, um, pretty successful in, in some of these cases. So the first one is, uh, we're going to, this is not necessarily chronologically, but uh, just giving it to you. We, we, we entered the Squire Elijah Pickin family tune in Center Cemetery in East Hartford back in August of 2000. And um, this was considered an empty tomb. They actually didn't know what it was. If you could see the front of the tomb here, uh, in the photograph, uh, there's no uh, family name. There's there's no indication of what this was, and so through time, once we got into the 20th and 21st century, um, there was uh, people have forgotten. Even archivists have forgotten uh, what this tomb was. They thought maybe it was a holding vault. Now, holding or receiving vaults were used when people died in the middle of the winter, uh, and there was you know New England snow and frozen earth just made it impractical to uh, um, dig by hand uh, with a shovel uh, through to uh, bury someone. So their coffins were often held in these holding vaults uh, until the spring, and then they were brought out and, and, -bur and buried, uh, if you will, appropriately. So many thought, in fact, this was an empty structure uh, and that it was, uh, in fact, most likely a, a holding vault. And as you could see in this slide that uh, the structure was in very, very poor shape by the time we got to 2000. Um, it, it was really falling apart. The, the cemetery is run, owned and run, operated by the um, town of East Hartford. So uh, they had sent workers over uh, in a project to restore, to, to find out, do an assessment of the, of, of the damage and what would need to be done to, to secure this structure. Uh, and when they were working, a couple of bricks fell through and fell into the interior of the, of the tomb. So when the workers decided they, they would, get, would open the tomb, go inside to see the extent of damage, um, when they went in, they were literally surprised to see skeletons and coffin remains all over, uh, uh, distributed throughout the, the, uh, the interior of, of, the, of the tomb. Uh, and I got a call at, at UConn from uh, Dora Sussman, rest her soul, who was the state historian at the time. Um, and she told me about the burials and they had no idea who these were and uh, could I come down and assist? And I said, of course I will. And uh, she said, and you really must come down because there's an Egyptian sarcophagus in this tomb. And I said, well, you know, this is a New England tomb and that's quite unlikely. But I came down anyway, and uh, when I did, I recognized their Egyptian sarcophagus. And you can see it here in the upper right photo. It is not Egyptian. It is a, a Fisk metallic burial case. These were patented in 1848. And if you could see here, it really takes the shape of the human body. On the lower picture, you could see the head, the shoulders, the hands are crossed. And the, the coffin itself, the case is tapered right down to the feet, which are upwards. Um, fantastic coffin. I had seen these in catalogs and I never saw one before this in person. Uh, and I was just blown away by it. Fortunately, uh, where the hands are, right in this area, and you could see it here in the lower one, um, there's a nameplate. And on it, it said, Dr. Edwin Pickin died 1851. And then everyone realized we were definitely in the Pickin family tomb. Uh, and, and, and so that allowed us to do some research. This uh, second coffin is a, is a metal coffin with glass covering almost the whole 
uh, upper portion and part of the lower portion. The glass now, after all these years, is cloudy and you can't see through it, but you would have been able to. And this was Carlissa Picken, the, the, the wife of Dr. Edwin. She uh, died uh, 20, 25 years later in, in uh, 1876. We were to, to um, uh, in our work, uh, determined that 16 members of the family, the Pickin family were buried in the tomb. And based on archival work and the family genealogy, we were able to determine that they were of the family of Elijah, uh, uh, Squire Elijah Pickin. Um, the Pickins, first of all, you should know, are one of the most prominent families in colonial New England. Um, one of the last colonial governors was William Pickin, who was Esqu uh, Elijah Pickin's uncle on his father's side. Um, the historian uh, Bruce Collin Daniels refers to the Pickins as Connecticut's first family. They settled, bought land on the east side of the river, what was part of the east side parish of Hartford. Today, it is, of course, the, the municipality of East Hartford, Connecticut. That didn't happen until after the Revolutionary War. But Squire Pickin was a very prominent trader, manufacturer. He was a, 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 in the military. He was a, a judge. Um, he, he's one of the first in the family to graduate from Yale. Uh, and he uh, and, and his brother, William, developed the first glassworks in Connecticut. And today, that is on the National Register of historic places in Manchester, and it's called the Pickin Glass Works. Um, so um, very prominent family. And, and Pickin, you know, he, he, one of his claims to fame is that his house uh, that is today has been moved actually uh, down to Guilford, Connecticut, uh, dismantled and moved, but it sits today just about where um, uh, I-84 now cuts through Main Street in East Hartford. Um, but it was um, a very prominent house and he had many guests. His most famous guest, I believe, is the French general uh, Rochambeau. Um, he stayed for almost a week at Pickens house when the French armies were encamped in East Hartford um, in uh, October, and November of 1782. 5,000 French troops crossed with Rochambeau. Rochambeau was meeting with uh, George Washington he, uh, Washington wanted to attack the British in New York City. Rochambeau convinced them, forget the city, let's go after the British army. And they were, along with the French naval vessels, able to trap um, General Cornwallis at Yorktown. And um, the rest is history with our, uh, the success of the American Revolution. But uh, Pickin uh, hosted um, Rochambeau and, and members of uh, the French military at, at his house. When we entered the tomb, um, it, it was a mess. And uh, in fact, one, um, uh, one of the workers uh, said, it looks like somebody vandalized. And I said, no, this is what you're looking at is the natural deterioration of the inside of the tomb. Uh, the coffins were stacked. They were placed on these, as you could see the um, um, brick partitions that went down the center aisle and, and every two feet off toward the side walls. Coffins were balanced on those to keep them from uh, sitting on the dirt. Um, and basically what has happened is that because they were stacked, eventually through time, desiccation of the, of the boards drying out, the, the side boards pop and everything collapses. Some collapse straight down and some collapse uh, off to the sides. And so uh, one of the jobs we had was to kind of put everything together. If you could uh, look at this slide, you see the brick partitions. Here's a bottom board resting on the brick. Here are skeletal remains of that individual, a headboard on top of that, and then the bottom board and skeletal remains of the person on top. So they were stacked. And as a result, uh, in some cases, we had individuals within their graves uh, on the bottom boards. In other cases, they were um, offloaded. What I did is, um, because we, we really did not have the opportunity to bring skeletal remains to the laboratory, we had to do everything on site. Um, what I would do is identify a burial and pass skeletal remains outside to Dr. Albert Harper, who assisted us. He, at the time, was the executive director of the Henry Lee Institute of Forensic Sciences at the University of New Haven, where he had brought students up uh, and started to um, conduct uh, on-site laboratory 
you know, to do as, as good a, a forensic identification of each individual as that we were able to mark and bring out. So this is a schematic done by my good buddy, Colin Hardy up at the Museum of Natural History at Yukon, which we are along attached to. Um, and this is a schematic of how we found the various remains. The, the light green or blue, if you will, is our males and the pink are our, our, our females. And you can see the layout. And of course you could see here uh, uh, the schematic of um, Dr. Edwin Pickens uh, um, Fisk uh, metallic case uh, here. Uh, I, I'm just gonna point out the one burial here on the end, this is on the back wall of the tomb as you walk into it. And that turns out to be uh, the remains of Squire Elijah Picken. He rests all by himself uh, along the back wall. When we were finished with the project, uh, there was a, a family reunion of uh, Pickens who actually, uh, some of which came from uh, England, from the, uh, from the United Kingdom. Uh, and they had a dedication of a stone you see here. This is a, a stone to give you a sense of size. It's five foot by five foot. And it basically tells uh, how uh, an archeological investigation uh, uncovered the remains and determined based not only on the biological forensic work, but the family genealogies, which were extremely helpful, um, exactly who of the Pickin family were buried uh, in the tomb. And so now we have a, a stone that marks that. Uh, you know, these people were anonymous. I mean, they were very prominent in their day, but forgotten today. Um, nobody knew who was in here. We had no records, no burial records. Um, um, John Spaulding did a, a great deal of archival work for us on this, um, and, but um, the only way we could do it was match up skeletons to the known genealogies, and uh, uh, we think it was it was, it was rather successful. Um, shortly after that, uh, two years later, uh, we got involved with the Gershom Buckley family tomb. This is in uh, uh, the Colchester burying ground. If you know Colchester, the, where the green is and the Congregational Church and where Baking Academy is, right behind that is the burying ground, the ancient burying ground. Uh, and back there is where um, uh, the Gershom Buckley tomb was. Uh, the problem was nobody for the last three generations or four generations even knew the tomb was there. So here's the story, guys. Um, in the 1920s, a group of students from ba Bacon Academy decided on Halloween that they would scare some of their classmates uh, by actually getting a real skull. So they broke into the Buckley tomb, which had a wooden door and was probably by, by the 1920s, pretty um, uh, easy to break into. We think the tomb was built sometime around 1775. They grabbed the skull, they put it on the end of a stake and they paraded around the town green with, the, with this skull. Um, and it caused such a commotion on Halloween um, that the town's fathers came in and none was more flabbergasted than the minister whose son was holding the pike, uh, the staff with, with the skull. Uh, needless to say, the boys were extremely reprimanded um, and I'm sure got a good whipping. Uh, but also they were made to cover up the tomb so that no one could ever go into it. So what they did um, with supervision, they uprooted footstones from the ancient burial ground, placed them in the, uh, um, the stairwell leading down into the tomb. They bricked up the wall and then they brought loads of soil in and completely buried the Buckley tomb. So much so by 2000, no one had any records any idea that there was even a tomb there. That ended up being completely covered. And you can see here, this is a later photograph for some of the facade uh, was now starting to be exposed. Um, when uh, in 2002, uh, the town owns the burial ground, but the Colchester Historical Society, working with Buckley family members, wanted to come in and clean up this cemetery. There are many Buckleys buried outside of this. Uh, and in the restoration project, um, they cut some grass down that had overgrown and they found three slabs to a marble epitaph. And when they put it together, it said the tomb of Gershom Buckley and his descendants. 
And that's when they first realized that this mound was hiding uh, the old Buckley tomb. And Peter Buckley, a direct descendant of Gershom Buckley, uh, was involved with the restoration. They contacted me up at UConn saying, um, would you come out and help us? We heard, they had heard what we had done with the pick and tomb. And we have no records as to who is in here. And I came down and, and just like this, I looked at this little mound and I said, well, you know, this is about probably even smaller than the pick and tomb. So uh, I thought, sure, we, we, we could do this and, and help out. Um, and if I only knew what I was getting into back then. The Buckley family, you may have heard, very prominent. Those of you from Hartford, you know, the Buckley Bridge. There used to be a baseball stadium called Buckley Stadium. Um, the Buckley family uh, uh, founded the life insurance company. Dr. Gershom Buckley, the Reverend Buckley uh, from the uh, 17th century, was an extraordinary uh, figure uh, at that time. Um, a colleague of the Winthrop, Jonathan Witham the Younger, um, and a famous surgeon from, from Wethersfield. The Buckley, Gershom Buckley, that built the tomb was his grandson, who was his namesake. Uh, but he's an extraordinary person. And also in the family pedigree is, I, I like to point out, Morgan Gardner Buckley, who uh, was not only uh, um, served as president of uh, Aetna Life Insurance, but he was the mayor of Hartford. He was the governor of the state of Connecticut. He was known as the crowbar governor because um, in one of the elections he was involved with, there was a dispute, an electional dispute. And um, they decided they couldn't figure out who had won the election or not. Sound familiar? Uh, anyhow, they, they couldn't figure out who had won the election or not. And uh, um, they locked uh, Gordon Buckley, uh, uh, Morgan Gardner Buckley was running for re-election. So he was already in, in the office and they locked his door. And when they locked his door, he came up, he got the custodian with a crowbar and they opened the, they, they broke open the, the door so he can continue to serve until the, 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 the election was, uh, dispute was resolved. Um, he's known today as the crowbar governor. He's also in the baseball hall of fame up in Cooperstown, New York, because he was the very first president of the National Baseball League. Um, prominent, prominent family, as you can well imagine. Now, Morgan is buried in Cedar Hill Cemetery, but um, Gershom Buckley uh, and his family are the ones buried in, in Colchester. So with the help of um, uh, FOSA and uh, the a ASC members, we started to uncover uh, this facade that had been buried since the 1920s, uh, opening up and exposing a stairwell. Uh, the stairwell going down had um, the footstones that the boys had laid to make sure nobody would ever go back in. Of course, they weren't counting on us at the time, uh, but we removed those and some of those were replaced in appropriately in the cemetery with their, with their graves. There was a brick wall. I was, we were able to remove some of the bricks on the top and I uh, was able to look into the tomb for the first time. Um, and I remember just being awestruck and uh, somebody behind me said, what do you see? And I couldn't help but say, I see wonderful things. Mimicking Howard Carter when he opened up Tutankhamen's tomb. But I didn't see wonderful things. What I saw was this. And what I saw was uh, tombs, uh, coffin material discarded, placed all over from again, not vandalism, but decomposition, it would turn out that they were burying many of that were stacked as many as four high. You could see uh, uh, coffin, some, some painted red. Um, you could see a, a human cranium here, another one here. Again, brick partitions like we saw in the Pekin tomb. Um, and here's a nameplate um, dating to the 1830s. So um, it was a, just a, a, an extraordinary, when I looked at this, I, I said, oh, what did I get myself involved in? And I knew this was quite bigger than what we had experienced with the Pekin tomb. Uh, and this will give you kind of an, an example. This was the Northwest corner of that near the front door. Um, and you can see here's a bottom board, skeletal remains. The cranium here has rolled uh, into the corner here. And this is it right here. The mandible has fallen off, but underneath you see there's another cranium and another bottom board. So once again, stacked. In this case though, they kind of fell 
Uh, some were still on, but many had fallen toward the center, um, center aisle. Um, so the first thing I did was I started to it where I could identify skeletal remains and bottom boards. I started to number each one of the burials uh, as effectively as I could, and then started to remove uh, map, remove um, uh, uh, coffin debris, wood out uh, of the of the uh, tomb, so we could work with the skeletal remains. Um, one of the things that was extremely helpful was that we found not only coffin lids, but lids that had brass tacks in great, uh, uh, hammered into them. So what they did is you can see, they took brass tacks and they hammered them into patterns. And you see the pattern here is a, a PB uh, with a heart motif and AE death uh, uh, at the age of 87, died March in the year 1798. We were working with the Buckley family and we had the Buckley um, family genealogy book, which was as thick as can be. But now that we had a, an age, initials and death, um, we could go to the family genealogy and in this case, identify Peter Buckley, who was born in 1712. So we had a whole host of these. In this case, it's JB died in 69 in 1807. This turns out to be John Buckley. Uh, this was one of uh, Gershom's brothers. Um, so uh, we now had some really good information. Unfortunately, not all the skeletal remains were associated with these, uh, but when they were, it was extremely helpful in making our, our forensic identifications. So what I would do is and when I could, it, if the bottom board was secure enough, I would place, I placed plywood underneath it and we were able to raise the whole skeletal remains and bottom board out in one piece after I had mapped it and identified it. Um, but in other cases, when that wasn't possible, we, we put the remains anatomically on a tray uh, with a burial number uh, and brought them, uh, brought them out for a, a inventorying and, and, and uh, packaging. Uh, again, Dr. Harper helped us uh, in the project. Uh, and you can see we had students here from uh, University of New Haven, U UConn, um, um, Wesleyan, um, uh, gosh, a number of other, uh, Boston College, a number of other universities that helped out along with uh, uh, FOSA and ASC members. Uh, the young woman on the, on the left here is Kristen Bastis. She was uh, uh, at that time a, a graduate student at the University of Connecticut, and she um, uh, would end up doing her master's thesis on the paleopathology of the Buckley family. And that was pretty, uh, uh, pretty uh, extensive. Um, and you could see uh, 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 some uh, vertebrae, these are lumbar vertebrae here, thoracic vertebrae up here of burial number 10, uh, uh, an adult male. And um, just to note that the lipping around these vertebral bodies is from severe osteoarthritis. Uh, in x-ray, the arthritis was so uh, extensive, it actually connected the bones. The bones were uh, connected by a ridge uh, of bone, the, the, uh, the, the vertebrae were connected by a ridge of bone so that um, uh, moving the, the backbone, uh, bending, turning would have, been, would have been extremely painful. We had uh, a, tr a lot of trauma, um, not many diseases, uh, but a lot of trauma. These were hardworking farmers, these, these Buckleys, even though they were very prominent and, 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 uh, and property owners. Uh, this is uh, 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 the femur, uh, the femur of an uh, individual that has a, a severe fracture. You can see it here, um, splitting the bone, uh, almost diagonally, the long bone diagonally. It did heal. You could see bone has resorbed here. There's a bone spur coming out here. Um, um, the, the individual, did, he did survive probably at least four or five years. But what this led to was a shortening of his leg. And that led to a secondary condition of arthritic uh, condition around uh, his femur head, and certainly um, uh, on the distal femur, it would be would be part of the knee joint. Here is that uh, same uh, element in in um, X-ray. You could see the shortening of the bone. Once it split, it, it dropped. Uh, and I, I showing this to some pathologists and, and doctors. Um, they're suggesting that uh, 
he did get medical attention, um, obviously back then, um, uh, probably in the early 19th century, he could not be, um, um, you know, cast as we would put in a broken bone. Uh, but basically they bound this very tightly uh, to keep the bones together and eventually it did heal, but it shortened his leg and it led to um, certainly not only a pronounced lip, limp, but certainly led to other uh, walking conditions like arthritis in his leg. This is what the tomb looked like when we emptied it. Can you imagine what you first saw in, in this? Um, and you can see the partitions very nicely to keep the, 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 the burials off the, um, the, um, um, the ground. Um, so um, the forensic work went on and eventually uh, there was another family reunion, this time of the Buckley family. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the remains were reburied. Here's uh, Collins' uh, schematic. Uh, of, you can see far more complex than the pig and tomb. Huh? Uh, and you can see that they were stacked in some cases uh, four high, um, which led to um, a lot of, uh, you know, putting individuals together again as best we could. Um, there were almost 30 individuals in this tomb. Um, and the restoration, once we removed everyone and cleaned it up, the, uh, the restoration of the interior and exterior moved forward. And if you were to go to Colchester Cemetery today um, along the, the, uh, the western uh, lower slope area, you would see the restored Buckley tomb. It's a beautiful, beautiful structure. Um, and like uh, the Pickens, uh, the Buckley family had an engraved stone put at the base of the tomb um, and uh, also naming now all the people uh, that were, in, were uh, identified uh, forensically and genealogically. My favorite in the whole one is this right down here, Sarah Buckley Wells. She was born in 1702. She died in 1798. She lived almost the entire 18th century and saw us go from a colony of the King of, Eng King of England, the Empire of England um, to um, our own nation. So what a lifespan she had. Uh, the third tomb restoration project was the Samuel Huntington tomb. And, and if you don't know who Samuel Huntington is, by the way, shame on you. Uh, and I say that because uh, I'm not surprised if you don't, because he's, we can refer to him as the um, forgotten founding father. Um, he's a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was president of the Confederation Congress in Philadelphia. He was uh, the 18th governor, colonial, and, and then uh, state governor uh, of Connecticut. In fact, he served 10 terms as governor of Connecticut. Uh, back then, of course, the governor's terms were only one year. So he was reelected. Uh, he was elected and reelected 10 times. Can you imagine? Um, he also served as Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, and of course he was a patriot, a statesman, and, and a lawyer. Um, we don't know much about him, you know, he, he wasn't the, the Renaissance man that Jefferson was, he wasn't, uh, um, you know, uh, flamboyant like Franklin, and he certainly was the leader of armies as Washington, but they all had the respect for Samuel Huntington. He was an extremely important person in the founding of our country. And he is the first, because he was president of the Confederation Congress, he, he helped guide uh, us through the, the final stages of Congress, through the final stages of the Revolutionary War. But he was president when the Articles of Confederation were ratified. And that means he is the first legislative president of the United States. Uh, Washington, George Washington, of course, he was the first executive president, executive branch president. But Huntington, um, you know, was a, a legislative president of the United States. Um, and so a very, very important individual. Um, his tomb <clears throat> had not, unlike the Pickett and, and Buckley tombs, hadn't been forgotten or didn't know it existed. Um, it, it was well known. The problem was the tomb was built in the 1790s and uh, by um, certainly by the, the, the 21st century, um, it was going through uh, tremendous uh, uh, deterioration. And you could see some of that here. The basic flaw in the development of the original tomb was that the facade, as you can see my cursor here, um, 
was pulling away from the body of the tomb. And you could see the, 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 the gap here. Th this is collapsing uh, uh, off of the, of the tomb and it had to be restored. In fact, I remember when I first went out here, I was able to take a camera and actually put my arms through the holes and take pictures of the interior before I, I even went inside. Um, so it was a bad need of restoration. And um, the, the Norwich Historical Society, who was president back then, was uh, Bill Stanley. Uh, Bill, uh, you know, rallied the troops and uh, um, um, raised funds, uh, private funds, uh, to, to restore this tomb and, and make it more appropriate for one of our founding fathers. And because the facade was falling off, uh, they needed um, uh, to remove it, and thus um, we needed to handle the human remains that would be inside to remove them during the restoration. Uh, we worked with a funeral director in town and then bring them back in new coffins uh, when appropriate. Um, so the interior of the Huntington tomb was much, much, much different than the Buckley or the Pickens tomb. First of all, it's a lot smaller. Um, it doesn't house 16 to 30 people. Um, but instead of brick partitions on the floor, what it did have was these flat field stones that were embedded into the side walls and back walls. And the coffins literally sat, and you can see up here on the upper right, this would be what the remains and what's left of the coffin and the, and the physical remains of Martha Huntington, um, uh, picking, uh, excuse me, uh, Samuel Huntington's uh, wife. And on the left side upper shelf is, um, Samuel Huntington. Because the, the, the coffin spanned the, the stones, with deterioration, the gaps in between, many coffin and skeletal remains fell down. Some got trapped on the second level, but many hit the floor. Uh, but because there were only two people in this, in this tomb, um, and not, uh, you know, 16 to 30, um, there, and because they were buried on two different sides, their uh, remains were not commingled, they were separated and we were able to very easily um, uh, define the two uh, uh, in their appropriate spatial places. Uh, Samuel and Martha never had any children, uh, but they did raise a, a niece and a nephew uh, in their household. And so th this tomb could at best fit four people, maybe five or six if you really uh, did, uh, did some uh, arranging. Um, so it's it much smaller and certainly not um, 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 uh, of the size of, of the others. Um, this is a picture I love uh, because it's John Spaulding. And this is the interior we're mapping, uh, uh, photographing um, uh, uh, the position of all the remains, uh, uh, skeletal and coffin. And, and you see John behind me holding up a light so that I could see better in, within the tomb. And, uh, John, um, uh, many of you, uh, those of you FOSA members and, and ASC members from long ago may remember John. John photo documented many of our projects, all of our projects for over a decade. And those uh, photo books and newspapers and, and, and documents are all still with the Office of State Archaeology that Sarah oversees uh, up at UConn. But I love this picture because because John took most of the pictures, so we never, he very seldom got into any. And so I uh, love this particular one because of that. But, you know, mapped, recovered material, um, the, the, all the skeletal remains were measured, analyzed. Most of it went on at the funeral parlor uh, uh, where, where all the skeletal remains were brought during the restoration of the tomb. Here are two of the most fantastic artifacts we found. And these were nameplates. These were on each of the coffins and um, plated beautifully. Uh, cleaned up. Uh, it says, it reads, His Excellency Samuel Huntington Esquire, governor of the state of Connecticut, was born July 16, 17, AD 1731, and died January 5th, 1796, at the age of 64. Fantastic. Now, normally, we don't see many uh, uh, um, nameplates until uh, like 1830s, 1840s. And that's when we really start seeing metal coffins coming in. Think of, think of uh, Dr. Edward Picken. Um, so for a nameplate in 1796, that's really cool. Um, there are some, uh, but these are rare. And we found one, of course, from Martha Huntington, consort, wife of 
uh, Samuel Huntington, governor of the state of Connecticut, uh, governor of this state, uh, died um, in June of 1794 at the age of 55. She died about a year and a half before Samuel uh, and about nine years younger. Uh, well, I, I could tell you about both of them forensically, uh, simply is uh, Martha had severe uh, osteoarthritic condition. Walking for her would have been very, very difficult. Her legs uh, and knees and, and, and were, um, the joints were just um, severe arthritis. Uh, she would have been a great candidate for a knee replacement today, but in 1790, that wasn't a, an option. Uh, and Samuel, uh, for, a, for a lawyer and a diplomat, uh, showed fairly robust bones. I mean, he was like uh, very robust, um, something you would expect from a, uh, somebody like a farmer or a blacksmith. So uh, kind of interesting in terms of the forensic of this. Here's a restoration of the tomb. You can see the facade had to be, uh, was taken off. Uh, they used as many of the original bricks as they possibly could, but when not, they, um, when the, the bricks weren't good, they, they, they brought in new bricks. Um, and you could see a better uh, image of the interior of the tomb here. Uh, and then the restoration took place. Once it was finished, um, uh, there was a, a, a reburial ceremony where Samuel and Martha were brought back with full military honors. That's Bill uh, Stanley, by the way, at the podium, uh, who really initiated this project. Um, the, the podium has representations from the Mohegan tribe, but also from the, the governor's office, the uh, congressional leaders and, and Senate leaders. Um, the, um, uh, Governor's foot guards served as pallbearers. They um, purchased uh, period style coffins, hexagonal coffins for both uh, Samuel and Martha, uh, draped it and after the ceremonies, um, they were brought back up to the tomb where they were, uh, the coffins were now brought in. It's a very small opening to this tomb, by the way, that the coffins could just about fit. Dave Cook, uh, rest his soul, and uh, a dear friend who, uh, uh, helped us on so many of these investigations. Uh, he and I were inside the tomb, receiving the coffins as the uh, as the foot guard were handing it on to us. And then we were seeing that Martha and uh, um, Samuel were put in their original appropriate places. Uh, and also, if you can look here, the name tags that we found um, were re uh, 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 placed onto these uh, tombs. Uh, uh, the new coffins, uh, and um, gee, uh, really well done in terms of the ceremony. I think the only complication was that Bill Stanley uh, had decided that uh, people that donated money toward the restoration should have uh, the privilege of, of placing a new brick to uh, over the closing uh, to hopefully close it permanently uh, as a nice gesture. However, when Dave and I were still inside the tomb, we heard these chinking sounds. And when I went uh, toward the opening to see what was going on, they were already starting to break up the, the tomb and we were still inside. Um, fortunately, I screamed loud enough for them to stop and uh, we were able to get out before uh, everything was sealed up. But uh, um, today, if you, you go back to Norwich Town Cemetery, um, you will see the restoration of Samuel Huntington's tomb appropriately for one of the founding fathers of our country. Um, gonna go through this real quick because I know we're running out of time and I'm testing your patience here. But uh, we went into uh, one of the first ones I had got called into actually in September of 1990 uh, after be becoming state archeologist in the late 80s, 1980s was the Chauncey family mausoleum. And this started as a police investigation with the Middletown Police Department. Um, basically they had found a skull uh, behind a car wash in Cromwell, Connecticut, just to the north of Middletown. And um, the medical examiner had them contact me for assistance. So I went down to Middletown and uh, took a look at the skull and gave them some preliminary identification. It was an adult woman, uh, 45 to 55 years of age, I, I identified of, of, of European ancestry. Um, I, one of the things I told the police is that the the the, the, the but the cranium had not been out in the, uh, in the open very long because there was no signs of bleaching from the sun or, or any other uh, environmental uh, aspects to it. Uh, but then I said, you know what, also, it's kind of interesting, this, the, the, the person based on cortical loss uh, decomposition has been dead for uh, over 100 years, I estimated, um, and probably older than that. 
I said, but it shows no signs of ever being buried. There's no soil, you know, soil will, you know, from a buried individual, the soils will eventually invade the, the auditory canals, uh, you know, various foramen. Uh, um, and in this case, there was no sign of any, any soil. I said, so kind of interesting, the person hasn't been uh, dead, uh, you know, has been dead over a hundred years, but has never been in the ground. Um, and that's when they said, would you come with us to uh, the Chauncey uh, Mausoleum? Uh, um, because there had been a break in. And so this is the middle part. These are the three prominent families, the Allsops, Chaunceys, and Mooters. The Mooters in uh, Philadelphia uh, founded one of the great museums uh, that is still down there. Uh, the Allsops were political and, and uh, business leaders right into the 20th century. And the Chauncey tomb, this was another very prominent family. Um, Charles Chauncey, the Reverend Charles Chauncey, came over uh, in the 1630s, um, part of that great migration of Puritans into New England. Uh, and he became the second president of Harvard College. Um, and the family had a series of ministers and, and intellectuals all the way down. By the 19th century, uh, Henry Chauncey, who you see here in the lower right, uh, was now a businessman and a merchant and very prominent. He would, along with uh, William Aspinwall up on top and over in the lower left, John um, L. Stevens, uh, together they would find, uh, found the Panamanian Railroad. Um, two things, um, this was before the Panama Canal, long before the Panama Canal. This was, this was uh, in the 1850s. Um, and the only way at that point to get to, from uh, say, uh, uh, you know, New York or across the continent from New York to San Francisco was either through the Oregon Trail or one of the trail systems that had developed, which would take months and months for you uh, and a great hardship to get through. Or you could take a, a ship down the low, below the, uh, the, the, uh, the continent of South America and come back up, which would take also weeks and months and so forth. So um, what the Panamanian Railroad did is cut that time to a week or just a little bit longer. Basically, uh, you took a steamship, say from New York down to Panama. The, they built the railroad that you would now cross the isthmus with, pick up another ship on the Pacific side and then go up to San Francisco or wherever you were going. So it really was a, a, a great enterprise and certainly um, made uh, uh, all of them uh, quite, a, quite a bit of money. When we went inside the Chauncey tomb, um, it had been, brutally vandalized. It was, uh, um, the, the burials were placed in vaults uh, in this case. Uh, um, this is much later, um, this, built, this tomb was probably built in the um, 1850s when Indian Hill Cemetery was uh, started. Um, and so uh, rather than being on, 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 on brick partitions, um, they were placed in vaults with uh, marble epitaphs two of them which had been busted into, broken into. You could see sledge uh, had hit the, the marble as well as crowbars to jack them off the wall. And then burials inside were brought out and displaced on the floor and rummaged through. Uh, it was a terrible uh, desecration uh, and vandalism. And so when we got in there, what we saw were on the floor, human remains, burial clothing, um, marble tombstones, coffin hardware, wood, uh, all piled. And so what we did is we kind of set up a grid, uh, you know, if you will, uh, and excavated the mounds. Uh, uh, and what that allowed us to do was map, uh, uh, you know, vertically as well as horizontally, the, the positions of the human remains and any of the coffin materials, which then allowed us to reconstruct the sequence of the vandalism, which burials had come out first, which ones were displaced on top. So it gave us a, 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 a whole list. There were basically uh, three burials that were vandalized. One was Charles Chauncey. He was a child, only five years old. He was laid in a zinc uh, lined coffin uh, covered with wood and so forth. Um, basically he died in Switzerland and his body was transported back by ship to Middletown to be buried in the family tomb. Um, so he is very heavily wrapped. They broke into his coffin. Uh, Henry Chauncey was in a raw iron coffin. You could see that right here. In fact, you could see the zinc coffin uh, to the far left. This is um, 
the, the cast iron, very heavy coffin of Henry Chauncey. They busted through that. Henry Chauncey had died um, at the age of 68 in 1863 at Mount Holly, New Jersey. Um, and he died suddenly at a friend's house. And so they conducted an autopsy. It's one of the earliest autopsies I've seen. Uh, and this is the, if you will, the crania, sawed crania of the top of his uh, cranial vault um, where they removed to, to examine the brain during the autopsy. And there was one wooden coffin displaced and that was of Lucy Chauncey, the wife of Henry Chauncey. And it turns out that um, Lucy, um, we can only find in the, in the tomb her postcranal remains. Uh, it turns out the skull behind the car wash um, would belong um, to Lucy Chauncey. We were able to um, restore that and uh, um, uh, fit with the mandible and, and so forth. Um, based on some of our work and of course other investigative leads, uh, the police were able to charge a man uh, for the vandalizing the city crypt. He was also wanted for armed robbery. Uh, so uh, they were very happy to put closure to this and, and, and put the, the individual. Uh, uh, by the way, the, the motive to go in here, um, the vandalism was for sa satanic cult uh, ritual. They were looking for skulls um, to um, use in ritual ceremonies. And rather than trying to dig through the soil, it was much easier to break into a tomb and get um, those, um, those remains for, for your rituals. And then we had the same thing happen, same motive happen um, in uh, 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 when we entered uh, the Edwin Dennison Morgan tomb in 2013. Um, it's an interesting case study. Uh, this was uh, done with the medical examiner office. The, the Morgan tomb was vandalized in 2008. The vandals had broken in. They clearly had stolen skeletal remains, displaced coffins off their vaults, much like the Chauncey uh, uh, a crypt, um, a tomb. And, um, but the, the case remained unsolved. The Hartford Police Department came in. They made record of it, but really had very little or no leads to go by. Then uh, in um, 2013, um, a domestic dispute in New Britain, Connecticut, led to uh, the police coming in to, to break out a domestic quarrel um, when they were taking the young man away uh, from uh, the apartment. Um, the young woman screamed out, and he's got skulls, he's got bones in the closet. And of course, the police stopped immediately, went into the closet. They found a suitcase, opened the suitcase up, and it had human remains in it, a skull and, and long bones. Um, they found a clay ceramic pot. And in that pot was not only a paraphernalia, but also a human skull. Uh, and that's when the case, um, the bones were brought to the state uh, medical examiner's office who opened up the investigation, um, asked us to come in uh, along with our colleagues at Quinnipiac University, who, who did a great study of here. Um, in uh, the suitcase, and you can see the photograph in the lower left, in the suitcase uh, was a name tag. Um, uh, and they had, they had stolen the name tag too. And uh, the name tag says Mary B.P. Morgan, 1857 to 1886. So that led the medical examiner and the investigation that this was from the Morgan tomb uh, and of course led to the understanding of the, the earlier vandalism that had occurred. Now, Denison, Edwin Dennison Morgan is one of the prominent uh, uh, successful businessmen and politicians of uh, the mid uh, to late 19th century. He was the 21st governor of the state of New York just before and during uh, parts of the Civil War. He was referred to as the volunteer governor because um, he, um, he actually enlisted over 125,000 men uh, from New York into the Union Army. So he was made a major general uh, a, a, as a result of that. He was the volunteer governor. He would later serve as a US Senator from New York. He, um, was uh, the first chairman of the Republican National Committee. In fact, he was chair of the convention in 1860 that nominated Abraham Lincoln 
for the presidency. And Lincoln wanted uh, Edwin Dennison Morgan as his secretary of treasurer, but uh, Morgan uh, would turn him down, uh, figuring he, he did not want to do that and remained in the United States uh, uh, Senate and as governor. Um, two um, vandals broke into the, to, to the, um, the tomb and just like a, a Chauncey tomb, they vandalized, in this case, two burials. They vandalized that of uh, Edwin Dennison Morgan, uh, who was along the back wall um, in another vault, his wife and children are there. He died in 1883, at the age of 72. And of course, Mary B. P. Morgan, who's on the right wall, and she's literally all alone. She's not there with her husband. Her husband was Edwin Dennison Morgan III, um, uh, the governor's grandson. So she was his uh, granddaughter-in-law, if you will. And, uh, but she's all alone by herself on the right side. So with the, with the dispute, with the suitcase uh, and the ceramic pot, we went to the medical examiner's office um, after visiting the tomb uh, and, and getting information there. Uh, and we now started to excavate, if you will, this pot. Now the pot had eventually Edwin Dennison Morgan's cranium in it. It had uh, five chicken heads, chicken feet, horseshoes, carved sticks, candles, um, coins, feathers, ritual crosses, cigar butts. Um, and as we excavated the contents of it, recording it all uh, in its spatial uh, location, um, you could see down here, the bottom had sand on it. You could see the mandible um, uh, of Edwin and two horseshoes uh, situated in it. There were also coins at the bottom, but um, a number of paraphernalia and, it, and um, uh, uh, our colleagues at Quinnipiac University's bioanthropology Research Institute, um, their Department of Diagnostic Imaging, um, did CAT scans, CT scans um, um, uh, of the pot. And you could see this uh, a kind of a, a transverse section of the ceramic pot. You see a stone down here. Here's the sand uh, and some of the paraphernalia. Here's Edwin Dennison Morgan's. Um, you can see a horseshoe back here. And look at this, see this in the back here? This is desiccated brain tissue. Um, that still had preserved. Uh, he was laying on his back and uh, the bottom end here of, of the brain still had preserved. And you can see kind of a, a three-dimensional reconstruction on the right with the horseshoes and, and some material colored uh, as we excavated uh, down through. Um, so the upshot of this, um, this was part of a Santeria uh, Pelo Mayombe ritual, uh, which is part of the Afro-Caribbean um, take some uh, Orisha uh, African rituals with Roman Catholic beliefs. Um, and basically it's, it's, it, these are healing uh, ceremonies for physical and mental illnesses. Santeria does not involve human remains, but paleo does. Um, and the way it works in the belief system is that um, you know, spirits still reside in the bones. Uh, and so that the more powerful people were in life, the more powerful their bones are in death. Uh, and the dead through the spirit of it can interact with the living. So uh, the rituals harness the energy from the bones uh, to change a patient's illness for, uh, for the better. But it does involve human remains uh, in its darker side. And as a result, um, you know, again, just like a Chauncey, uh, you know, remains are, are much easier to get in a, um, um, in a tomb if you could break into one as opposed to digging. So uh, positive uh, forensic identifications of Mary and Edwin. Um, uh, here are uh, more uh, scans of this is uh, uh, Mary. You could see the, the, the lines radiating out from the kitchen. That's because she had gold fillings uh, in, her, uh, in her molars. Uh, but um, Quinnipiac University was able to, uh, uh, to get some more detail on the bones. One of the things we did is we compared the inventory of skeletal remains that were still in the tomb and those that we had with Mary and Edwin from uh, the vandalism, and they matched up accordingly. What was missing was um, the elements that we had. So we were able to bring them back to the tomb and restore them uh, to their appropriate uh, coffins and um, articulate them them once again. Um, and, and you see here uh, uh, the remains of, of Mary. These were all in that coffin 
uh, anatomical reconstruction. Um, and again, the, the remains match the missing, uh, those that were uh, missing from uh, the vandalized tomb. Um, also, um, we could not find any images of, of Mary. Um, very prominent, we thought we would find a photograph of her um, or, or a painting, and we haven't been able to do that yet. Uh, so um, our colleague, Joe Mullins at George Mason University, Department of the, the Forensic Science there, um, took the, the CT scans that Quinnipiac did, uh, Jerry Kunlong and, and his crew, uh, and uh, reconstructed the, the craniofacial remains based on that. So here's a schematic of what we think uh, Mary might have looked like. Um, so in a nutshell, guys, uh, running very quickly through obviously far more detail in history and forensics and, uh, and archeology span in the book, but um, um, amazing, uh, amazing uh, stories and, uh, um, and hopefully amazing science that we wanted to bring forth for, for the public. And again, indebted to uh, FOSA members and ASC members who uh, have helped me. I, I tried to list everybody and in, in, in acknowledgements, but uh, I'm sure I missed a couple of people and I dearly apologize if I have. Um, the book is out. It, it is available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, all other book outlets, or you can order it uh, directly from uh, the publisher, the distributor, Casemate, uh, at casematepublishers.com. Um, so um, they did a beautiful job with the production. A lot of color images, uh, very glossy, uh, wonderful book production. Too bad the writing isn't as good, but the book production itself is, is, is pretty amazing. So I'm going to, if I can figure this out, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, and there you are, Paul, and if I'm back, uh, my room is getting darker, but you don't need to see me. Um, are we back, Paul? We are back, yeah, yeah. So um, if there are any questions, I, I'm gonna click on the Q&A. Is that appropriate? Yeah, that's great, yeah. Okay, Can let me do it? that. And hey, Beth Morrison, how are you, Beth? And she says, thanks, Nick, very interesting talk. and wonderful to see you, uh, all the best. And same to you, Beth, uh, thanks for coming on board. And, and hopefully we can get together uh, sometime soon. That, that would be great, but uh, thanks. And it's good to hear from you. I'm sorry I couldn't see you, but, and you had to uh, unfortunately see me, but, uh, uh, great to uh, great to hear from you. Thank you. Let's see. We have okay, Cinda. We're going to bring you back on. This is your chance to uh, shine with a question. Are you? There. I just wanted to thank Nick for that excellent lecture because I've never heard about all the tombs that you did together. I know I worked out a few to identify wood from coffins. That's right. This Cindy, did, uh, Cindy did uh, some of the coffin analysis of the wood, uh, the identifying species for us. On you did the Buckley tomb, I think, and um, a couple, maybe another one. I'm yeah, sure. I think, and I can't remember what the other one was. That's right. Was so wonderful, and once again, it's just such a pleasure to listen to you give a lecture. It's so You're actually mentioned in the book, by the way. <laughs> oh, goody, goody. <laughs> so thank you for coming to us and presenting all that tonight. That was wonderful. Thank you. Well, it's great to hear you, Bryce. And congratulations to all those people that helped. I mean, the fact that you could identify all those people, you know, it's, that you identified them with the help of all those forensic helpers. Um, well, the, you know, the forensics gave us the blueprint of, uh, of you know, the sex, uh, ages, uh, um, you know, traumas, different things that we could glean. Uh, and then basically really was using the genealogical record. Okay. Uh, you know, basically using the family genealogies like the Pickens, you know, we we knew, um, um, you know, the, the, the children of uh, Elijah Picken or um, uh, uh, Gershom Buckley, we, we, we had their families. In fact, when we were at the, the Buckley tomb, we had a, a, an easel set up. We were working with the, the, the Buckley family members, as I mentioned, and we had an easel set up with uh, uh, the whole pedigree, uh, wow. with the whole family tree. And so as we found, you know, a, a coffin lid and, and skeletal remains, we were able to chalk off, here's Peter Buckley uh, and so forth. So, um, and then others, 
we were less sure of that, um, you know, we had skeletal remains or a young adult male um, uh, that would fit the description of, you know, say one of his sons or something, but, you know, couldn't be totally good, 100% sure on some of that, but um, it's a combination of genealogy, you know, history, what we can learn about the families and forensics wow. and archeology span because the placement of these burials, I made an assumption that uh, the people, the individuals, the coffins on the bottom, on the, on the bricks were the earliest uh, remains, the earliest people that died and subsequent burials, kind of like stratigraphy, if you will, yeah. uh, were, were uh, on top so that the more recent burials were on top. So knowing the positions too, um, uh, in terms of the archeological mapping was also helpful in, in delineating individuals based on when they died. So a little, a little detective work, uh, some cases we could be 100% sure and others less, less sure. One, wonderful job. I wish I could have been there in the field. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Nick. Oh, thank you, Cindy. Great to hear you. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, Judy. Uh, Judy, it's wonderful. Nice to talk to you. Glad to see uh, you're enjoying retirement. Yes, I, I, I think I'm retired. I, I really can't. Uh, uh, sometimes it doesn't feel like it, but uh, thanks, Judy. And um, yes, I am enjoying retirement. And Sarah's doing a marvelous job, and we're just so proud of her. And uh, um, uh, and the work she's doing. And we can bring on Dawn. All right, it's your time to shine, Dawn. Oh, actually the question I think is coming from Ernie. Hey, Nick, good job. Hey, Ernie. Uh, I was wondering, how, uh, I remember I was asked by uh, the Fairfield police one time to take a look at an open grave shaft. Um, how often do these occur in Connecticut uh, for the various uh, satanic or religious rituals? the episodes yeah. of uh, grave robbing. Yes, you remember correctly. If I remember correctly on that one too, that was a, a below ground. They dug into the grave yes. uh, through, yes. through the ground, am I, am I correct? Right, but they were digging in the wrong place. They didn't That's know right. about the <laughs> headstones and footstones. That's right. The, the, what, the, what Ernie's referring to here is that um, when you go into an old cemetery and you read, here lies Jonathan Edwards, Jonathan's not in front of the tombstone as we normally think, but actually behind the tombstone with his feet moving away uh, and a footstone usually placed there. So uh, fortunately the vandals uh, were digging on the wrong side of the tombstone. <laughs> but I remember that case too, Ernie. Yeah. How often does this happen in the state? Uh, say again? How often does that happen in the state? You know, um, during my tenure, I think we had three cases uh, of satanic cult rituals occurring. Uh, oh, actually, we, uh, that's not even count Morgan. So counting Morgan is four, something like that. The one you mm -hmm. referred to in uh, um, um, Fairfield. I think we had one in Ledyard, and then, uh, uh, and of course, the, the Chauncey and 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 the uh, um, the Morgan uh, tombs, uh, but. Um, you know, not too often, but it does happen, uh, you know, and yeah. how more recently, I, I have no idea. Uh, but um, um, yeah, it's very unfortunate um, uh, that they would go in. And, but they w I worked with one police officer who actually had developed a, a chronology, if you will, or a, a, an annual cycle, a, a kind of a calendar cycle of satanic cult rituals, so that one time part of the year they needed they wanted hands and feet other part of the year they wanted a skull and so he wow. would actually have that trace that cycle um uh, to see if he can coordinate it with uh, vandalisms but uh, hmm. not too often but unfortunately often enough sure thank you you bet buddy looks like you have just a comment in the q a from Kristen. Um, and I think we have time for like one more question, if anybody has one more question. Okay, I've got uh, Kristen on, I see her. Uh, thank you for like, it's been a fascinating, can't wait to read the book. I'm just beginning to career in anthropology and archeology, span and I hope to have the privilege of learning from you. Well, um, absolutely, let's uh, send me an email, uh, nicholas.bellantoni at uconn.edu. Um, and uh, let's, uh, I know we, we, we talked about getting together and, uh, 
hopefully we'll have that opportunity soon. But best of luck in your studies. All right. Well, um, hold on. Let me bring myself back into the visible realm. Hello. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bellantoni, for, for coming and for speaking about this awesome book. I can't wait to read it. Um, and thank you for everyone who attended uh, our third of four. Um, I, and I just wanted to give a quick sales pitch for next week. Uh, next week at this time, Wednesday, June 2nd at 7 p.m., we're going to have uh, Dr. David Leslie talking about um, uh, the subject is more than court shatter, Gulf Coast, Maine, archaic tradition, occupation in Plainville, Massachusetts. So um, you guys can sign up for that um, at ctarchaeology.org slash events uh, if you guys are interested in that. And um Again, thank you, uh, Dr. Valentoni, for, for talking about this awesome subject. It's always good to, uh, to listen to you speak. Uh, thank you, Paul. And thank you, all of you, for, for, for attending. And I can't wait to see you all in person. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs>